particular areas to try and detect it. In one particular case, four sheep were found dead, but only three had the classic mutilation injuries. David Caton examined the seemingly healthy sheep. And I found, uh, I have an image of this actually, you might like to look at yeah. later, two very small, couple of millimetre holes between the eye and the ear, sort of there. Um, and I turned it over, I found one on the opposite side. Um, and that's all I could find. Uh, but whether that had something to do with it being put to death, we have no idea. So for some reason, so, um, you know, yeah. whoever did this wasn't interested yeah. in that particular lab. Yeah, but well, when it was examined in the laboratory later by pathologist Professor Tony Fremont, mm -hmm. he, in fact, his first reaction was they looked a bit like 0 0.22 pellet mm -hmm. holes, and he was quite surprised to find uh, when he removed the skin, etc., working down to the skull that the hole only penetrated just into the skin and the flesh. In fact, the bone, he said, was not marked whatsoever. Right. So whatever was applied each side to the head of the lamb hadn't penetrated hard enough to damage the bone underneath the, the, the flesh. There appears to be a high degree of consistency in some of these medical-type procedures. Uh, I have a, a measuring stick. Right. Um, Measure the depth. Yes, yes. It's marked off right. in, in inches, right. in half inches. Um, sounds a bit odd, but uh, yeah. so I then passed that into the anal area right. and found it was five and a half inches. Right. And I find that depth in a lamb of young age mm -hmm. to be the same every time. So that is indicative of the coring implement right. to be set somehow. To, to, to measure and extract the right proportion of the digestive system right. each time. You're probably extremely curious to get to the bottom of what's going on here. So how do you, you know, eliminate um, the different um, explanations that people come forward with? For example, um, it's just it's satanic cults who are killing these animals for their sacrifices and they're taking their blood, etc. How do you know it's not that? Well, obviously, we're looking for the, for the truth and for answers to understand what's taking place. So, obviously, we are, we are not qualified or have the experience in many areas. So, obviously, we consult with people that have experience. And we've had a number of uh, police officers, uh, some retired and some not, that have given their assistance and have, in, in, have briefed us in depth of what satanic cults actually involve and how the procedures uh, are conducted on animals for rituals mm -hmm. and and we go through these procedures and they said the majority of them that animals will be will be actually dragged to a a, a low level stream or brook mm -hmm. and they actually be staked into the stream mm -hmm. and then they will actually be excised whatever tissue that's been removed the, the sacrifice take place and then the blood will run down the stream there'll be no evidence on the ground and, and other evidence will be removed so we're exploring this and these people are saying that what the pictures we actually show them is not consistent in any shape or form to animal ritualistic killings. Also, there's never any evidence of tracks or footprints around the carcass, which obviously there would be if it was down to satanic cults. Those satanists have got to get onto the farm. They've got the added problem, as we've described before, of actually catching the animal, especially in the dark, uh, lifting it into some vehicle, taking it away to wherever to wherever their ritual is taking place, do the, the business, and then they're risking being caught a second time by taking it back. What about evidence of other animals, foxes, badgers? Um, could these not be caused by, by predatory animals? Well, in, in, in some cases, obviously the animal looks to have been clinically killed and a predator's come in afterwards for an easy meal and contaminated some of the actual cuts and procedures. So there's a combination of two. Now, if animals such as foxes or badgers are actually carrying out these attacks, we should be very concerned because there's good surgeons. And I spent with Robert Hulse uh, two hours, oh no, sorry, it was nearly three hours with Professor Don Kelly a veterinary professor at Liverpool University. Uh, um, he, he was very unhappy about what we were showing him. 
And he found it very hard to reluctantly admit as we were leaving. We were there at two o'clock, it was five o'clock when we were leaving. And I'd shown him umpteen images, including quite a few of Linda Moulton House from the States. So it was cows, everything. And he, as we were parting, he actually sort of agreed, albeit very reluctantly, that a lot of the cases we'd shown him did not fit into the criteria of natural animal predation. And that we could see he was disturbed and bothered by it. These are removal of tissue and organs that even vets that we talked to said they will have difficulty doing these procedures in that environment on the side of a hill in the middle of the night, sometimes in appalling conditions. They said they couldn't do this or replicate that in their own vet, veterinary laboratories. Okay then, well what about, um, it could be a government secret project? Um, mm, that makes no sense to us in as much that um, if it was a secret project that was totally covert and, and they wanted to sample the livestock for, for whatever reason, they would be far better off actually buying the animals or the carcasses from the slaughterhouses. It would be much less conspicuous because the one thing we never understand here or in other parts of the world is, is why would you actually sample or take samples from a carcass and then leave the carcass to be found by the farmer or investigators like ourselves. Well, a lot of people have come up with that notion that government agencies and even the military or parts of the military are involved in um, this covert operation. But A, they've committed an offence because they've gone on the farmer's land, which is trespass in the first instance. They've stolen the farmer, farmer's livestock, which is theft. And then the, 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 if they were doing that, let's just say for a minute, we we'll go along with that idea, that line of thinking. <coughs> They've taken the animal away somewhere, back to some laboratory, to do all these sophisticated um, excision of, of organs and the blood and all the rest of it. Having done that, why would you bother to take the animal back to the location or near location where it was taken from in the first place? Yeah. And, and risk being caught, if not the first time, by the farmer returning the carcass feeling slightly frustrated that there seems to be no answer to all of this, I decided to contact DEFRA, which is a government department who deal with farmers and farm animals. I contacted the helpline and explained my concerns. They told me to contact David Sims, a higher executive officer who deals with customer services. I emailed David Sims, but he did not reply. I telephoned him several days later, and he appeared to have no knowledge of my email. He then said that it was referred to the customer services contact unit and the email had been placed in a general mailbox. I asked him for a name of who was dealing with this. He could not give me one. They appear to have sent me round in a circle. I believe that you actually got a phone call after you placed the advert in the Farmers Weekly. Can you describe that for yeah, us? Yes, that's correct. Yes, it was about three weeks after the advert went out, which is every Friday on Farmers Weekly, and this voice, fem female voice said, uh, just to check, she got Mr. Caton on the end of the phone. I said, yes, I'm speaking. And then the next line was, I'm calling from the Office of the Ministry of Agricultural Food and Fisheries at Preston. She didn't identify herself by name or the, where the premises were in Preston. Uh, and this is the sort of tone and inflection in her voice, and this is the way she said, I'll never forget this. Is this to do with the aliens? Not that we know anything about that. And that... that totally took me by surprise. And the fact that she said, we, not I, which suggests that she was talking about at least her department, uh, which I established to be at Barton Hall Labs. She demanded to know the name of the professor of pathology who had been assisting me with looking at the carcasses. And I declined to give her that because at the time we decided to keep Tony's name out of the frame in case he got any hassle from anybody and that suggested by her question, they were prepared to give him some. Farmers have actually paid for a necropsy of the animal to try and determine exactly what and why the animal has been killed. And the report has been very vague and it's concentrated on, on different uh, things that are not relevant to the injuries that have been, have been detected. That they've, they've, they've actually left out the major injuries uh, as unexplainable and they, they haven't I suppose in some respects they don't want to really cross that line 
because they know there's something very unusual taking place. Uh, a number of years ago, I, I contacted and actually wrote to 65 vets and given them a, an outline of information, even saying I would send free v videos and information packs, and I didn't receive a response from one vet. There seems to be some sort of stigma to this particular, particular type of animal death. And then she said, uh, the farmers have no right, Mr. Caton, to give up their dead animal carcasses to the likes of you for unofficial experimentation. So I sort of countered that by saying, but uh, if the farmer, uh, this is not unofficial experimentation, if the farmer decides he would like to know what caused the death and have a post-mortem done to establish that. What by a qualified pathologist. As by, well. Yeah, qualified pathologist, yeah. And then her response to that was, oh, because of BSE. From which I said, well, are you now telling me we have a problem with BSE with sheep? In June 2006, uh, there was a, a, a mutilation attack on Dartmoor. Three animals were killed, and uh, one of these was removed uh, by myself and brought back to the West Midlands for uh, a necropsy report to be carried out by a vet. Uh, only I knew the identity of the vet, the, the farmer didn't know, Phil Hoyle didn't know, uh, my wife didn't know, so it was quite a guarded secret. Uh, however, uh, I had to ring the vet from Dartmoor and tell them that the animal was on its way, uh, so I phoned them on my mobile. About a week later, uh, I, I received a call from the vet who asked me, um, who told me that they'd been contacted by the local environmental health officer and that he had demanded a copy of the post-mortem report on the sheep and also demanded to for them to give details about myself. So I asked her, I said, is this normal? She said, this has never happened before, which I thought was highly curious. She then said, we've taken legal advice to see whether we should disclose this information to the environmental health officer. He said, unfortunately, that, that legal advice suggests that we do have to release your details. How do you feel about that? I said, give them my details and give them a copy of the post-mortem report. Leehurst campus at Neston in Liverpool, which is the main DEFRA university centre for uh, animal diseases. And plainly, they had instructed my mobile phone records to be accessed to get the identity of the vet. David Caton gives another example of government interference. They found two mature sheep mutilated with four inch diameter rectal cores and I think there were other injuries. But they were puzzled that obviously removed them off the field and put them in the barn deciding what to do. Now the following day having put them in the barn the farmer had to go to Leicestershire somewhere on business and was off the premises and during the day the, the stockman was sort of looking after the, uh, the place and the silver BMW the state car uh, arrived at the gate and they, they came in the yard and these two gentlemen approached uh, showing the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries identity cards which were green coloured he remembered and they said to him oh we've come for the two sheep so the stockman assumed his boss the farmer had arranged that and so he actually assisted them into their back of the car and off they went. The farmer comes back happens to go in the barn, sees the missing and says to him, well, what have you done with the two sheep? So the stockman said, oh, well, the minister, men from the ministry came and removed them, I, I thought, at your request. And the farmer was very cross about that because uh, in his terms, the, the, the MAF had in fact stolen two of the animals, albeit they're dead, but it was the principle of it. They decided to write to me. And... Uh, this lifelong friend had a brother who was a chief inspector in the Oxfordshire Constabulary. So the farmer said to him, you get your brother to contact the MAF and complain about my st stolen sheep. Yeah. So <coughs> the police officer duly did that. And the first person 
who answered the phone at the MAF headquarters in London, denied all knowledge they knew anything about it. Um, he was quite officious, apparently, in his tone to the police officer, who had some rank. And, um, and he, the police officer said, well, look, we've got a witness, i.e. the stockman, who was shown ID cards from you people. So I want to speak to someone more senior. And unless the farmer drops his complaint, I'm sort of duty bound to take this if necessary to court. Having said something like that, <coughs> this gentleman then said, well, if I were you, I should drop the case. In any case, the farmer will be compensated. Which, so they did an immediate U-turn then by him saying that. Obviously knew the farmer's address to say to where to send this compensation check to. And then this gentleman got even more officious and said to him, <coughs> inferring it would be damaging perhaps to his career prospects and not in his best interest or whatever to drop the case. And in any case, like if you don't, you'll be hearing from your superiors. And allegedly, sometime later they contacted me and they had been told from high level to drop the case. Sean Limbert, who is an associate of David Caton's, wrote to the MAF and questioned them about this issue. We've been looking into the claims made in your letter that DEFRA, formerly MAF, officials were involved in an incident when a Northamptonshire farmer found two of his sheep dead. In particular, you have alleged that DEFRA, that a DEFRA official warned off a police inspector from investigating the matter further. I can confirm that DEFRA has not been involved in this investigation at any level. Now, in view of the serious nature of these offences, I, I, can, I can also confirm that the police are the relevant authority for the investigation of such incidents. DEFRA have not been known to comment on the mutilation problem. In 1998, however, a statement was faxed to the BBC in Manchester. And it was from the MAF uh, press office from a gentleman signing himself as Stuart Dobbs and it reads the series of animal mutilation have been very distressing for the farmers involved and the majority of these incidents have been reported to the police as very serious offences and are being dealt with them at present so that infers that the MAF knew this was going on and the police were dealing with things as a result it is not for the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food to pass comment on these incidents as they are being handled by the relevant authorities. And one assumes they mean relevant authorities being the police. Tony Dodd had told me in the past that he had written to, to the MAF and to the National Veterinary College and to the um, NFU, the National Farmers Union, asking what information they had on this topic and he received blank denials from all three of them. So when I made Tony aware of this new statement from their press office, he was uh, quite pleased about it. In addition to the, the, the wounds that are left on these animals, is there any, uh, is there any other evidence that you've, that you've managed to find? Well, wh what has been reported over the years is a number of farms, the farmer finds unusual ground markings. Now, this is a consistency that's also been detected in the US. Now these markings are actually like a banded horseshoe type of markings and they actually uh, range from around 1.5 meters to 6.5 meters across. The actual width of the band is around 200 millimeters across. But inside the band in itself, right next to where the mutilations take place, the grass becomes darker but the, but the actual soil becomes baked like it's been so, some sort of energy or heat has interacted with it. We've even broke the trowels trying to take samples. Right. We've had a